The reason that our country is in the mess that it is in today is not because of the Republicans, it's not because of the Democrats. Let me tell you this, it's because of lame Christians. There is a reproach that comes with being a follower of Christ. We in America have tried to reshape the whole church so that it's palatable and likable in the culture. A church that is accepted well with the culture is usually not accepted well with Christ. The church is a fortress, and a fortress is strength. A fortress is might. Not only a center of defense, but a place of strategic planning and offense. Our God does not expect us to wait for the darkness to enclose around us. He expects us to take up His banner and fight the darkness with His light. You want to know what the biggest problem with America is? The wolf is this country. Gave in, gave in to public pressure, gave in to political correctness. One of the greatest curses this country has ever had to deal with is political correctness. Preparing the Christian to shine the light against the darkness of this world. Welcome to Our Mighty Fortress Podcast. I am your host, Ron Miller, and welcome to the show. We have an absolutely fascinating subject to cover today, but first, please go ahead and hit that follow or subscribe button on the podcast platform which you're listening to us upon we have several social media platforms with all sorts of material that you can listen to and read. Check us out on our fan page on Facebook when you type in the search bar, the at symbol Mighty Fortress 313. That page is growing more and more every day. If you are listening through our YouTube page, go ahead and click that like button for the video and be sure to subscribe to the channel. It really, really helps us out. You can also visit our website at OurMightyFortress.com. There we have a host of articles, videos, and even a link to our merch store to help support the work. And, of course, if you do feel so motivated to donate to the work that we do here, feel free to do so through our website in the established PayPal link. By following and supporting the podcast, you let me know that you care about the subjects that we discuss. Today, I would like to continue our series in ancient Christians. And I want to talk about our ancient historical Christian roots going back through time and show how God Almighty protected and brought up his church. I want to take a step further with the people known as the Waldensians because they, by far, had the most impact upon the European peninsula and into England. Be sure to listen to part one of this series or episode 56 where I give more of a foundation about these godly people. There is not one single history book that I gather all of these sources from, uh, but I'll have to put up a bibliography on the website. Uh, that way you can take a look at them. Most of these books are free on public domain. Some of them are kind of tough to get and are kind of expensive too, by the way, but bringing all of these resources together for those who are writing about and maybe favor the Waldenses, but also the resources that are written by their enemies, because you can also learn what they believed and sometimes the lies that are told by what the enemies say. But often you'll hear the truth about why your enemies hate you so much. There are so many outstanding resources on these people but I will say that the more that you study these people, you'll find that the opponents to these people are very pro-Catholic or Protestant slash Catholic, I should say, because a lot of the Protestant movement is going back, swinging back to the mother church. So a lot of the church history books will write these people off as heretics and believing all sorts of fantasy nonsense. But the problem is, is that you can go and read what they wrote what they believed for yourself and you can see that as blatant lies i absolutely love history and i do believe that history tends to tell the truth now it can be argued that the winners of wars are the ones who write the history books and there is an element of truth in that but you cannot hide the truth forever what do i mean take for instance a more modern example well relatively modern you can take a joseph stalin and the communist dictatorship of the ussr slash russia well in his geographical region 
he did control truth, sort of say, and what the people could find out because he had to point guns inward and keep people in. But the rest of the world knew the truth. And when those that iron curtain came down, the truth came flooding in and people knew that they had been lied to. So no matter how you try to hide the truth, it always emerges. And that's one of the things, the great things about history, and especially in dealing with our study here with these people. You can go and read what these people believed, the Waldensian people, what they believed. And for yourself, you don't have to just read a history book because I'm sorry to say it, most of the history books that are written are written by popish uh, type individuals because you have to ask the question, why would they blatantly lie, claiming to be church historians, yet you can read what these people believe through the centuries, and yet they still lie in the church history books. There's only one reason for that, and that's because they salute Rome. I will say that this podcast specifically won't be a glamorous one, nor will it be some great exposition of scripture necessarily, but I do want to tell you about men and women who stood for the word of God to the very end. I have to warn you though, there are going to be some very disturbing things that I'm going to say in this podcast because I'm going to tell you what happened to these poor people, but you know what? It's good for your soul to know how important your faith in Christ actually is. We stand on the backs of many godly men and women who stood for their faith in the face of adversity, and they would not back down. Let this embolden us in our modern world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that introduction, let's get right into this. I will be primarily referencing the historical work called The History of the Waldenses by J.A. Wiley. It's a free resource that you can get. It's a very old book, but there are lots and lots of resources on these people. But let me go ahead and set the background. The Alps, uh, the mountain range of northern Italy, are the highest and most extensive uh, mountain ranges, uh, mountain range system in Europe. This was the home of the Waldensian people. These folks have been persecuted through the centuries for holding to a biblical faith and the representation of the church that Jesus Christ set in the New Testament. There were those who thought that the best way to get rid of these people was to march an army into their towns and villages and slaughter them. More specifically, the Roman Catholics. The Waldensian movement touched many people through many centuries and attracted converts from everywhere. Many Roman Catholics were won over, and some of them doubtless brought some error with them. Moreover, the term Waldenses is somewhat generic, which some, having overlooked, have fallen into mistakes in regard to them. The name embraced peoples living in widely separate lands, and they varied in customs and possibly somewhat in doctrines. There was a conference between the poor man of Lombardy and the Waldenses, the Italian and French Waldenses probably had a different origin, and and in the conference they had found that there were some differences between them. What do I mean? It is possible that people who claim to be Waldenses or maybe were in, uh, descendants of the people from the Alps, maybe they moved further into Italy, and the further you get to Rome, the easier it is to pick up some of the Romish way. So... There may have been some Italian Waldenses that might have believed in, say, an infant baptism, but you weren't going to find that in, say, the French, the southern French side of, of where the Waldenses live and even much of the Alps. The confessions of the faith of the Waldenses indicate that they did not practice infant baptism. There is a confession of faith which was published by a man named Perrin in Geneva, and despite the writings about what they believed, uh, and being against infant baptism, infant baptism more specifically, you have Catholic writers today <laughs> advocating that, hey, the Waldenses practice nothing but infant baptism. But it's simply not true. The lies of Rome are not true. There were believers outside the Catholic Church. But they'll say, well, no, there, there were not Christians or legitimate churches outside the, you know, the Protestant movement or before the Protestant movement. 
and they say that half heartedly about the Protestants now, anyways. They didn't say that back then, but they say that half heartedly now because they want the Protestant movement to come back to the Mother Church, in which much of them are. The Waldensian missionaries spread truth about baptism uh, throughout Europe, and this would later uh, be the foundation for the future Anabaptists that you would hear more about uh, in the Reformation. But now I want to get to the area about the persecutions. The atrocities against this people are just too many and heartbreaking. While some of these stories are very gruesome, it is important to read them because it reminds us of how this world is not our home. And not our friend either, by the way. And persecutions are going to be abounding here very soon, I believe. When the Inquisition, the Catholic Inquisition, first started, it salutes victims silently but in 1488 open force was used and soldiers were sent against the common peasant from that time on the sword had been the instrument of the persecutor whole valleys of the alps uh, of the waldenses were depopulated and inhabitants driven into caverns and they would be suffocated with smoke hundreds of children were found dead together some mingled with in the most in, uh, inhumane manner the young women were ravaged in the presence of their fathers and their brothers and then brutally murdered. Men were hurled off cliffs and tortures and violence unparalleled endured until these Protestant valleys were soaked in blood and the hillsides covered with the bones of thousands of the inhabitants. Decency forbids to name the enormities practice on the unoffending people because they just wanted to worship God according to their own consciences. Catholic armies would move from town to town to village to village. The shouts of infuriated men and shrieks of women and children made the sweet valley ring with terrific echoes. The ordinary means of torture were not sufficient, and the new modes of cruelty. Infants were pulled from the rest of their mothers, and their brains dashed out against the rocks. Mothers and daughters were ravaged in each other's, in each other's pre presence and then filled with pebbles and their mouths and ears powder was crammed and set fire to and thus helpless sufferers were blown up. Sick people were tied with their heads and their feet together and thrown down the precipices. Many of both sexes and all ages were impaled alive and thus naked and writhing around in agony were planted along the highways. I would dare say that unless you're living in the Middle East in a primarily Muslim country or even some places in Southeast Asia, much of us in the Western world have no clue what actual persecution is like. I mean, we can claim persecution a little here, a little there, but we don't endure the cruelty of man, the true cruelty and punishment uh, that is dealt upon us because of sin. The wickedness that would just come forth out of men's hearts. And the terrible evil that they would do to another human being. I remember what I said. As hard as it is to hear it. It is good for your soul. It is good to be reminded what it means to be a Christian. The persecution carries on. With the extinction of the Waldenses and Calabria. It says, quote, but these horrors pale before the bloody tragedy of Montalto enacted by the Marquis du Bacini, whose zeal was quickened, and it said, by the promise of the cardinal's hat to his brother if he would clear Calabria of heresy. Now, this is a very interesting point. I have a few books on my shelf that talk about the, and this is written by secular individuals, no religion, you know, uh, bias uh, included. Well, I assume so anyways. It was, it's written by against the Catholics, but not exactly by a Christian. And it's written how the corruption of Rome and the popes would just give cardinal hats or seats of power to individuals to get people to do what they want. Think about it. It had nothing to do with their belief in the Catholic Church. Just this, It was just a seat of power that was granted out of favor. Now think about how bad and terrible that would get just by itself, even if you did believe the right things. Even if the Catholic Church was was not the whore of Babylon or whatever, even if you did 
believe the right things, granting power to those just out of favor or, or not, well, religious, uh, a religious seat of authority anyways, just because out of favor and not about what they believe. I mean, that just all points towards corruption. There's no way around it. The story carries on. A servant described by the letter of this account, Most illustrious sir, I have now to inform you of the dreadful injustices which have began uh, to be executed upon these Lutherans early this morning, begin, uh, being at the 11th of June. Now, here, this writer calls these guys, calls the Waldensians Lutherans, because at this time the Protestant Reformation was going on, and everybody across Europe had heard about Luther. But the, but the thing is, though, is these people predate Luther. <laughs> so, well, anyways, it was just a common thing. So they, this guy called the Waldensians Lutherans at, the, at this time. And he carries on. He says, and to tell you the truth, I can compare it to nothing but the slaughter of so many sheep. They were all shut up in one house as a sheepfold. And the executioner went and bringing out of them, covered his face with a napkin, as we call it, and led him out to the field near the house and causing him to kneel down and cut his throat with a knife. Then, taking off the bloody napkin, he went and brought out another, whom he put to death in the same manner. In this way, the whole number, amounting to eight, 88 men, were butchered. I leave you to figure to yourself the lamentable spectacle, spectacle, because I can scarcely refrain from tears while I write. Nor was there any person, after witnessing the ex execution of one, could stand to look on a second. The meekness and patience with which they went to martyrdom and death are incredible. Some of them at their death profess themselves in the same faith with us but the greater part died in their cursed obstinacy all of the old met their death with cheerfulness but the young exhibited symptoms of fear i still shudder while i think of the executioner with the bloody knife in his teeth and the dripping napkin in his hand and his arms besmeared with gore going to the house and taking out one victim after another as a butcher does with the sheep that he's meant to kill, end quote. Such a powerful story, a true story of a man who's writing down and telling what he witnessed of these poor people just taken out one by one to a field and being executed. The preachers didn't fare any better either. The execution of Jean-Louis Pachal, who was a Waldensian preacher, dragged to Rome, and he was tried, actually, before the Pope and his council. In his final remarks before his death, he said, quote, Now, mind you, this is before the Pope. Good people, I am come here to die for confessing the doctrine of my divine master and savior, Jesus Christ. Then he turned to Pope Pius IV, he arraigned him as the enemy of Christ and the persecutor of his people and the antichrist of scripture and concluded by summoning him and all of his cardinals to answer for their cruelties and murders before the throne of the Lamb. At his words, says the historian Crespin, the people were deeply moved and the Pope and the cardinals gnashed their teeth. It is stories like that in the time of tremendous adversity that the true character of a person comes out and you hear a preacher who will get up and stand before authorities and defy them and still hold to Christ and not deny the living God what powerful powerful stories because on the flip side of that there have been many who in order to save their own life denied Christ. Actually, that was one of the very first church controversies, the early, early church controversies. We're talking like right after the apostles type, where after the great persecution, some denied the faith to save their life, not have their head chopped off or whatever else. And then they try to come moseying back into the church. And people who knew about their situation say, whoa, 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 hold on. I know what you did. And so there was this great debate about their salvation, what to do with them, with the church, do they allow them to come back or whatever, but it was a huge deal, especially about what Jesus said about denying him. At the time of the Waldensians, you had the emergence of the Jesuits, which was a, a Catholic order, 
think of the Jesuits as the first major powerful CIA agency. I mean, the things that they uh, had done and arguably are still doing, extremely powerful agency. But the Jesuits were unleashed upon the Waldenses and would challenge their leaders and try to persuade people against them. But all these acts of violences only had the effect of causing the Valdoi or the Walden Waldenses uh, still more to detest the Jesuits, who were the instigators of them. The monks, therefore, thought it proper to seek for some victories in the field of controversy. They would challenge Valdoi pastors to, you know, debates and discussions. The weapons of controversy seem to have been equally well managed on both sides, but reasoning does not produce faith. Religious life is not the result of some log uh, logical syllogism. The dialectics of Rome broke down before the authority of the Bible. The Waldensians would participate in the surrounding politics, believe it or not. And some would even arm themselves and form militias to protect their beloved valleys. Now, this is extremely interesting because this was a very, very controversial subject in their time, even in the early church. It can be in ours, maybe in the Western, not so much in the Western world, because we do have a lot of Christians who will serve in the military. I mean, I got, I became born again. I got saved while I was in the military. But there's that question of, should a Christian serve in the military, take people's lives, that type of thing. And you have the issue, especially when it comes to being a pastor, then you have the issue of David in the temple and bloody having bloody hands and how that can translate to being a pastor. And so there's a lot of controversy with this particular subject. And it's it's very hard to work that out, actually, if you just use New Testament theology. Ultimately, knowing the principles of the word of God and seeking to protect those who could not protect themselves, there were men who did take a stand against the evading Catholic armies. The next story I'll tell you is not only true, but God blessed those who would take a stand against evil. You're going to hear about a great miracle that took place as well through the mercy of God. Now, there are so many powerful stories, but I want to focus in on the year 1689 and a man named Henry Arnaud. At this time, the French armies uh, were called by the Pope of Rome to march against the Piedmont or the Valleys of the Alps and, salted, and sought to dominate the area along with exterminating the Waldensian people. Many had been driven out of their homes and out of the land in which they lived for centuries. There was a group that said enough is enough and stood against the tyranny of the French. You can see here on page 134 this grand story of J.A. Wiley's The History of the Waldenses. It says, quote, At this crisis on so many previous ones, a distinguished man arose to lead them. Henry Arnaud, who was the head of 800 fighting men, who now set out for their native possessions, and at first discharged the office of the pastor, but the troubles of his na uh, nation compelling him to leave the valleys he had served in in the armies of the Prince of Orange. Now, this is interesting. This man used to be a pastor, but he set that down and take up arms to defend his people. Of decided piety, ardent patriotism, and of great de uh, decision and courage, he presented a beautiful instance of the union of the pastoral and the military character. It is hard to say whether his soldiers listened more reverentially to the exhortations he had it at times delivered to him to them from the pulpit or to the orders he gave them on the field of battle. Arriving on the southern shore of the lake, these 800 Valdoi bent their knees in prayer and began their march through a country covered with foes. Before them rose the great snow-clad mountains over which they were to fight their way. Or not arranged his little host into three companies, an advance guard, a center, and a rear guard. Seizing some of the chief men as hostages, they traversed the valley of the Arve and emerged from its dangerous passes just as the men of the latter place had completed their preparations for resisting them. Occasional skirmishes awaited them, but mostly their march was unopposed, for the terror of God had fallen upon the inhabitants of the Savoy. Holding on their way, they climbed the Alps, 
and next to the Bon Homme, they the neighboring Alp, uh, sinking sometimes in the middle of the snow, steep precipices and treacherous glaciers subjected them both toil and danger. They were wet with the rain, which at times fell in torrents. Their provisions were growing scanty, but their supply was recruited by the shepherds of the mountains who brought them bread and cheese while their huts uh, served them at night. Now, this is pretty interesting. In this first part of the story, you have 800 men who followed Henry to go out and meet the French armies that had come into the valley. Now, this French army had divided itself to be able to conquer more territory so they're going to take on different parts of the uh, of the french uh, armies there and take on different garrisons that they had set up and whatever not in these engagements they would kill hundreds of french soldiers and of course having only 800 men against smaller detachments of say 2500 or a little more and then they would eventually take on the main detachment on the main hub of the army of 25,000, or I believe at that time it was about 18,000. So God had protected them battle after battle, and they would lose good men. It would drop from about 800 to about 700 men. It was at this time that Henry, the soldier pastor, mounted the table which was placed on the porch, preached to them. He began to worship and chanting the 74th Psalm, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth an anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? The preacher then looked at his text in the 129th Psalm. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, may Israel now say. The wonderful history of his people behind him, so to speak, and the reconquest of their land before them, they must have called up glorious achievements of their fathers, provoking the generous emulation of their sons. The worship was closed by those 700 warriors chanting in magnificent chorus the psalm from which their leaders had, or their leader had preached. It was after this that this somewhat little band of men, 700 against thousands, would take on and utterly annihilate about 2,000 uh, French soldiers in a valley that they had utterly destroyed the inhabitants of. It was at this point that they would come to somewhat hunker themselves down in what was called the La Basiglia, or it's kind of like a, a fort in a way. So at this time, it's getting pretty cold, and the weather wasn't exactly the greatest up in the Alps. If you know anything about the Alps, <laughs> it's pretty rough. But they had shelter and whatever not. They just conquered that area, decided to take up shelter there. Well, this La Basiglia was on the terraces of the mountain that Henry Arnaud and his patriot warriors pitched their camp. And, of course, the main French army had heard about where they were at and thus came at them in force. It was just before winter when the French army had, had come and they laid siege to the Basiglia. But the Valdois held their position and God protected them. And they repulsed the French with a great slaughter of the enemy. And they did not lose one man. Not one of the defenders, not one of the Valdois was lost. Well, in war in the ancient times, you had seasons of fighting. Today, you don't really have that as much. You can fight pretty much you know, year round. But... In the harsh winters, they would just take a break, so to say, and then come back in the spring. That's exactly what the French did. They would leave because the the winter was were pretty harsh in the Alps, and so they would leave and try to come back in the spring. They came back to the the Basiglia with twenty two thousand men, had ten thousand French and uh, twelve thousand of the uh, Piedmontese. They would batter the Basiglia, and just wear down the Waldenses, but the Waldenses held the French army back. You got to think, it was 700 men against 22,000. That's terrible odds. Well, men did die, and they were down to about 400 Waldensians left. The French commander was so bold in, uh, as far as his belief, that he was going to try to hang the survivors. He made about 400 ropes to hang 
he had actual uh, deuces to be able to hang any of the survivors that may have been left. And he was so confident that he was going to conquer the uh, Basiglia within the next few days that uh, just the arrogance and pride came out. But God is going to have something for him. The French tried to be clever and send about 500 men that were supported by 7,000 musketeers. And they would try to advance and storm the fortress from a, from a particular angle. They rushed forward and threw themselves upon the palisades, but they found it impossible to tear them down. Formed as they were of great trunks, fastened by mighty boulders, massed behind the defense of the Valdoy. The younger men loading muskets and the veterans taking steady, steady aim while the besiegers were falling in dozens at every volley. The assailants beginning to waver, the Waldensians made a fierce sally, sword in hand, and cut in pieces those whom the musket had spared. Of the 500 picked soldiers, only some score lived to rejoin the main body, which had been the spectators from the valleys of their total rout. Incredible as it may appear, we are nevertheless assured it is a fact that not a Valdoy was killed or wounded at that time. Not a bullet had touched one of them. Going back to the Basiglia, they didn't bask in their victory, though, even though it was a small victory. Because the French, having it come to nightfall, decided that they were going to bring out the cannons and just completely blast down the wall. So all through the night, they had the cannons roaring, just tearing into the fort, tearing into the walls. And their goal was that by morning time, the walls would be utterly destroyed and they could just march right in and take on the, the survivors of the Waldensians. Never before had destruction appeared uh, to just be so inevitably impending for the Valdoy. To remain where they were was certain death, yet were they going to flee? Behind them rose these unscalable precipices of the mountains and beneath them lay the valley of swarming foes. If they should wait until the morning broke, it would be impossible to pass the enemy without being seen. And even now, although it was night, the numerous fire camps blazed beneath them and almost was bright as day. But the hour of their extremity was a time of God's opportunity. Let me read that again. But the hour of their extremity was the time of God's opportunity. Often before it had been seen to be so, but perhaps never so strikingly as now, while they looked this way and that way, but could discover no escape from the net that enclosed them, the mist began to gather on the summits of the mountains around them. They knew the old mantle that was wont to be cast around their fathers in the hour of peril. That mist from the mountains crept lower and yet lower, on the great mountains. Now it touched the supreme peak of the uh, the Basiglia. Will it mock their hopes? Will it only touch, but not cover their mountain camp? Again in its motion, downward roll the white fleecy billows, and now it hangs in sheltering folds around the war battered fortress and its handful of heroic defenders. They dare not as yet to attempt to escape. For still the watchfires burned brightly in the valley, but it was only for a, a few minutes longer. The mist kept its downward course, and now all was dark. The entire gorge where the army was, the invading army, was filled with the white mist. At this moment, as the garrison stood mute, pondering whereunto these things could grow, one of the captains broke silence. He bade them to be of good courage, for he knew the paths, and would conduct them to pass the French army by a track known only to himself. Crawling on their hands and knees, and passing close to the French sentinels, yet hidden from them by the mist, they descended uh, down the frightful precipices and made their escape. He who has not seen such paths, says Henry Arnaud, cannot conceive the danger of them and will be inclined to consider my, the account of the march a mere fiction. But it is strictly true, and I must add, the place is so frightful that even some of the Valdoy themselves were terror-struck when they saw by daylight the nature of the spot they had passed in the dark. 
When the day broke, every eye in the plain below was turned to the Basiglia. That day, 400 ropes, ropes which the French general had brought with them, were put in requisition, and they were prepared to be uh, to use to, to be used. But to his utter amazement, he found the Basiglia abandoned. The Valdois had escaped and were gone, and might be seen upon the distant mountains climbing the snows far out reach uh, of their would be captors. Now, think about this story. If it was kind of hard to follow, let me somewhat just briefly explain. So you have to understand that the cannons were roaring all night and just tearing on down the walls. And the walls of the of the fort were essentially keeping the uh, main force of the French army back. And the way that the army had to climb up the, the steep slope, it was kind of easy for the Valdoy to defend. Well, once the, those walls came down, the men kind of just sighed to themselves saying, well, I guess this is it. I guess we're about to meet the Lord. Well, and the Lord said, nope, I still have more for you to do. He caused a mist to descend down from the mountains and just flood into the valleys. Then one of the guys said, hey, I know a path. And then he took him right around the French army. And the, the mist was so thick they couldn't see. They had no clue that the soldiers escaped right beside them. And so when the sun fully came up and the mist uh, dissipated, they went to go march in the fortress and found it empty. Now that is a miracle of God. And you can look at that in the last part of the story. Uh, it's Henry Arnaud writing, you know, basically he's saying, you know, if I hadn't experienced it, I wouldn't have believed it myself. But it happened. God delivered. Now, why do I tell these stories? Some of it was a little hard to hear. I end, I started with some of the rougher stuff, but I did end on a very positive note. What is going to take place in the future of Christianity and the emergence of the Antichrist and how we're going to live through that or, or go through that whole mess? I don't know. But one thing's for sure, whether you're martyred or whether you're able to stick around and and fight against you know against evil and to and to uh, spread the gospel of Christ we don't, we don't know what's going to happen until that day comes but there were saints that met martyrdom and were and there were those who did stand up and God delivered them too martyrdom is a blessed thing for the christian and God takes that very seriously but if it's not your time it's not your time and God does bless warriors as well but i think there is a fine line between the holy spirit moving in that part and i think that's a topic for another podcast that i'll do in the future about that very fine line but take note of these ancient christians and take hope that it doesn't matter that the world comes against you in the most minor of situations to the most serious situations where your life is threatened the Lord will be with you. I want to thank you for listening. And be sure to follow us on the podcast media. Please take a look at our website, OurMightyFortress.com, and subscribe for more updates. Stay tuned next time for more great content. And remember to find your refuge and strength in Our Mighty Fortress.